Hey folks, welcome back to the channel and today I am going to talk about The Wall of Storms, the second book in the Dandelion Dynasty by Ken Liu and holy crap this is where things really escalate. So at the start of this book we pick up a few years after the events of The Grace of Kings. The conflict between Kunigaru and Matazindu is over and done with and Emperor Ragni I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't spoil who Emperor Ragni is, which one of them. He now rules the, he, he now rules the unified islands of Dara. So, it's been six years and, the, you know, the, the family, Emperor Ragni and his court has pretty much settled into the task of ruling. Now, given there's a time jump, we meet a lot, a, lot, a fair number of new characters and even the old characters who we've known to this point, they've grown, they've changed, they've become a little more wiser, a little more practiced in what they do. Um, all that being said, the, the, rule, the rule of Emperor Agni is not quite a peaceful one. We have the, the, the way in which things played out between Kunigaru and Matazindu did give rise to, it did, did lead to one of them who was betrayed being held up as kind of this heroic, this this kind of martyred figure that the people who are less than happy with Emperor Agni's rule kind kind of uphold as as kind of like a standard, a, a, an ideal to look towards, and it's it's kind of like a blade in the side of Emperor Agni's rule. It. It's not quite to the point of active rebellion or or an active attempt to overthrow his rule, but it is a thorn in his side that that will grow if left unchecked, and that's kind of where we where we are at the start of this book. Now, there a few other things do happen in here, like a, a brilliant young scholar joins the court, and. This scholar has radical ideas that are going to change the way things are done, things are handled in the empire so far. It's going to have pretty intense ramifications because the changes are are very much going to fly in the in what's been long-standing tradition, long-standing practice for this society and this culture, and it's that particular plot thread I bring up because it's it's one of the one of the themes of these books that I really enjoy and it's the it's the progress of time it's the march of time while honoring your traditions and your culture it's there there is there is a tipping point at which point you do have to say like just because we've always done things a certain way doesn't mean there is not a better way and that that's kind of what that subplot encapsulates, and of course everyone ha with a stake in it has the, has has a view based on their personal, the, based on their personal preferences. Like the people who stand to lose are obviously vehemently against these changes, and the people with a lot to gain are obviously in support of these changes. That kind of thing. So it it always boils down to how can I benefit. Right, but yeah, that that's kind of the story of the uh, of the Wall of Storms so far. Before I get to the really good part of this book, which is there is a threat on the horizon that is coming fast, it's coming hard, and the islands of Dara are very much unprepared for it. When it comes, things will never be the same. That that entire thing is pretty much how I would summarize this book. Um, so what do I think of The Wall of Storms? Ken Liu went hard. Like this, this book is... The, the Grace of Kings was all about building the backstory, laying the foundation, lay, t taking the time to lay a very strong, very wide, very vibrant foundation. And this book is when things just start, I should say. I, I like some a lot of a, a lot of crazy stuff happens in here pretty much from start to finish that we already we've been introduced to this to this uh, to these islands of Daru 
we we seen them at a moment in time, at a place in time, in a, in a particular form. And this book is all about change, change to the society, change to the culture, change to the traditions, change to the people. It's all about change from this entire book, and. Um, in true epic fantasy style fashion, a lot of that change is driven by politics, it's driven by war, it's driven by... And, and this is one of the things that makes Ken Liu's book so, like, really enjoyable to read. A lot of the change is also driven by technology, which in these books, like, as much as he incorporates some elements of the fantastical, there, there are quite a few elements of the fantastical. This is fantasy after all. There is no, like, overt magic per se beyond the presence of some interfering gods um, who are little more than people basically betting in, uh, in their version of a horse race. The magic per se in this book is more about scientific advancement and technological progress not drastic not over the top not but nevertheless progress and um yeah like the, the one of the other things i really enjoyed about this book is that it's just the way can you put together this story so there throughout epic fantasy there are a lot of major plots and minor plots that are very are very well known, are very common, are very well used. And Ken Liu finds a way to take these plots and not necessarily use them in the way that we're commonly accustomed to seeing them. So things like the hero's journey, the path to redemption, these kind of things. Like you know those kind of those kind of subplots. They um Ken Liu takes some of them and incorporates them into this book and he also finds new stories that he chooses to bring into the story like the 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 subplot of the scholar for example like I can't think of uh I, I can't really think of an epic fantasy novel where we have a situation where the scholar is they, where it's basically like a culture clash of tradition versus modernity in in that kind of um in that kind of epic fantasy context. Um, and it's all driven by the characters. Like like I mentioned, we have a lot of new characters. We have a lot of old characters who've returned in new in pretty much new forms. And their stories, their their paths are a lot of what drive these these not if not necessarily in some cases unique plots, in other cases plots that are familiar to us but handled just a wee bit differently so all in all between like the, the way these plots and subplots are handled it creates a book that is very much epic fancy but it reads very differently from anything you've read so far and that's what, one of the things that just makes it very compelling very engaging very engrossing and very unforgettable um, of course the like so, something put stitched together on this caliber wouldn't work if we didn't have characters we were heavily invested in to drive things forward, and if we didn't have writing like a, a writing style that just works wonders to really glue everything together and to really hook you and to keep you engaged and to keep you just wanting to read more. And Ken Liu has that skill, that capacity, thankfully. To essentially be the, the the keel of this ship, to really hold things together in such a wonderful, amazing way. Because that's just the thing. Like, it, the the story, it's not. He he doesn't tell the story in like an overly flowery, flowery prose or anything like that. But he does have moments in how he chooses to portray events, in his descriptions, in his comparisons, these kind of things, that like, n not so much one-liners uh, one as the way he puts together certain paragraphs and certain sections of the book that just, it just enchants you. Well, it did for me at least. Like, it, it just kept, it just absorbed me, I just enjoyed reading how these things are, are presented to me. So, and then of course we get major major changes in the story as a whole 
because, like I mentioned, there there was a threat to the islands of Dara that kind of it it kind of set the stage for how the series will play out as a whole because it is the it is the wildest thing that's happened in these books so far, and yeah, like um, I by the end of it, I was com- I was completely hooked. I couldn't wait to dive into the Veiled Throne, which I found out at the time is actually the first half of the final concluding volume that Ken Lee wrote. That was like almost eight hundred thousand words or something like that. No publisher could mass produce it, so they essentially just split the final volume into two books. So that should be interesting, and um, yeah, like a lot of people have said, you know, the Grace of Kings. They, they've taken a little while to get into it. Um, these books are a massive investment, so I'm hesitant to say wait uh, until uh, d- to do the, the standard epic fantasy fan thing and be like, oh, it only gets good at book X. I, I'm hesitant to say, oh, you need to read the first two books to really get engaged into it. But if you liked The Grace of Kings enough, wh- whatever your issues with it, if you liked it enough to think you may want to give this book a shot, you definitely should. Because it feels like this book sets the stage for what the series as a whole will be. And it's it's a much more strong, it's much more compelling, it's a much more action-packed, it's a much more intense book than The Grace of Kings. The Grace of Kings, now, now having read The Wall of Storms, The Grace of Kings almost feels like 800 pages of just setting the stage. <laughs> of... Building, building the history and setting the stage for this, the story that that's really so that that's at the core of this series. Like it's a very strong book too, and it's not often that you see a book two launch the overarching or the overarching plot of a series. Oftentimes, it's more like the lag in the middle of the of the series where people try to. Deal with the ramifications of book one while setting the stage for book two. No, that, that's not the case here. Like this, this book, this book feels like it launches everything, and I can't wait to see where it goes from here. So, massive enjoyment out of this, needless to be said. And yeah, um, I'm not gonna waste any more time talking about this because I've already spent quite a bit. I'm a fan. I'm a huge fan. I get the hype. Shockingly, this is one case where I'll, I'll say that this series is not overhyped. Like, it deserves, I, I get why it's so beloved. It definitely deserves that love. If, if you're considering picking up this series, you absolutely should. And if you're a fan of epic fantasy, you do not want to miss this. Like, I, I'll wait f- to read the other two books to say it for a fact, but I do get the sense that this is going to go down as a classic of the genre. That... It's going to be one of those series that people will try very hard to imitate, but they're not going to be able to. It's just, it's very unique in how it approaches things. It's very creative. And, yeah, um, if you've made it this far into the video, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.